budget deal. Democrats on Capitol Hill come up with a revised plan. Find out what's in and what's out. White House reaction. President Joe Biden praises the proposal before leaving on his trip to the Vatican. Path to healing. Why the Holy Father accepted an invitation to visit Canada. And border crisis. The dilemma facing the Biden administration as migrants pour into the country. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, October 28th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of St. Simon and Jude. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden made an early appearance on Capitol Hill today, attempting to make a final sale of his massive multi-trillion dollar social agenda. It has been the subject of several months of infighting between progressives and moderate Democrats. But the question is, will that trip seal the deal? Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Details are still emerging about the president's proposal even after the early Democrat caucus meeting. Progressives tell me that they are leery about saying they're going to vote for the plan. They want to see it in writing first. I think we need something a little bit more than just something on the back of an envelope. I think legislative text is one mechanism of us getting there. I think we're open to other mechanisms, but it needs to be something a little bit more than the back of an envelope. I just want to see what's actually in it because it's very difficult to make a decision on anything without seeing what's in it. And, um, and I think that's what we need to do now. The top line number is around $1.75 trillion, down significantly from the $3.5 trillion progressives wanted. According to the White House, the plan includes climate change initiatives, child care and preschool assistance, earned income tax credit for one year, and affordable housing. So do Democrats think it can pass? It's a message of unification, the party coming together to do something that's historic mm -hmm. and to make sure that everybody is heard. Do you have enough you, votes? Well, I didn't count the peas in there, but uh, my sense is based on the reception that it's very, very close. Mm -hmm. But not in the framework or key provisions that progressives had hoped for. Paid family and medical leave, prescription drug reform, and immigration reform. Republicans continue to say the president's plan is nothing more than reckless spending. Let's just be very clear. They're going to raise taxes. It's not going to bring in the revenue that they think it's going to bring in. It's going to bring in less revenue as a result overall. And so what it's going to mean is that we're going to increase deficits and increase debt. Happens every time. They're incompetent. I don't know how else to say it. And uh, they're pushing policies that are going to make things worse, not better. It's important to note the reconciliation bill still does not contain the Hyde Amendment or other pro-life protections. The text of the bill should be done in a few days. Republicans vow to go through it with a fine-tooth comb. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. After President Joe Biden's trip to Capitol Hill, his motorcade headed back to the White House, where just before leaving for Rome, he took his case right to the American people. This as opponents of the plan remain resolutely against it. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. President Joe Biden, now on his way overseas, left Washington today believing and announcing that he has a deal. It's just not a done deal. President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden walk across the South Lawn on their way to Marine One and then on to Italy. But before heading out from the East Room of the White House, he once again urged lawmakers and as many Americans as possible Today, uh, to get on board with his massive spending agenda. And he believes it's close. After months of tough and thoughtful negotiations, I think we have an historic, I know we have a historic economic framework. In his meeting with lawmakers at the Capitol, according to those who attended, President Biden said he wanted to show world leaders, Russia and China included, that democracies still work. His plan, while greatly reduced, is still sweeping in scope. It's a framework that will create millions of jobs, grow the economy, invest in our nation and our people. And leaning into the microphone, asked the wealthy to pay your fair share. 
Meanwhile, we learn President Joe Biden's visit to the Vatican tomorrow will not be broadcast live. Cameras will show his motorcade arrive at the Apostolic Palace, but we'll have to wait for the Vatican to release video of the president meeting with Pope Francis. They've exchanged letters, and they will have a chance just to reflect each of them on their view of what's happening in the world. Also, hundreds of soldiers and police are already on guard in Rome. Leaders of 20 countries representing the world's biggest economies, including President Biden, will be meeting for the G20 summit. Now, regarding paying for Build Back Better, lots of ways being proposed, but the Heritage Foundation tweeted, wealth taxes have been tried and failed, end quote. Now, after his speech today, the president did not take any questions from reporters, and after he travels to Italy and Scotland, he returns home next week. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Our reaction continues to pour in following the announcement yesterday that Pope Francis will visit Canada. The Holy Father says that he hopes the trip will help efforts at forgiveness with indigenous peoples following revelations of the Catholic Church's role in the abuse and death of thousands of Native children. The Holy Father was invited by Canada's Someone. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They say that they are, quote, grateful for the Vatican's announcement. The bishops add that they are in contact with leaders from the Indigenous Peoples community, and they are praying the trip will be a milestone in the journey towards healing. A group of Indigenous Canadians will meet Pope Francis at the Vatican in December. At the meeting, the group is expected to ask for the release of all records that relate to the residential schools, a date for the Holy Father's trip to Canada has not yet been announced. And joining us now is Archbishop Richard Gagnon, head of the Diocese of Winnipeg and former president of the Catholic Conference of Canada. Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, first thank off, you. for those who may not be familiar, uh, can you quickly talk about the controversy in Canada regarding the residential schools and what happened there so many years ago? Well, it's a long story. I mean, uh, residential schools, boarding schools, industrial schools have been present in Canada, most predominantly in West Canada, Western Canada, for 140 years. So it's a long, a long period of time. And uh, these schools served uh, uh, as a means of, uh, if you will, a simulation of the Indigenous people uh, into Canadian society. But at the same time, uh, there were lots of neglects of their own culture and language and heritage and family. Family life was disturbed in that process. And so starting um, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in Canada for five years, uh, giving voice, uh, listening to the voice of Indigenous people who have suffered uh, through this process, through this structure of residential schools, and uh, recommendations came forward as to what needs to be done in Canada to uh, improve uh, relationships between Indigenous people and, in general, Canadian society. And that, of course, would include the Catholic Church, which, were, which was one of the entities that ran the schools on behalf of the government. They were government schools, but they were administered and run by the church. And so th this is the long history uh, behind it and um, a lot of suffering, family suffering, individual sufferings. There's been, there were abuses in the school and so on over those many years for quite a few generations. Yeah. Um, and as we mentioned, the Holy Father plans to visit Canada. No date has been set yet. That said, what do you think it says that Pope Francis will be making the trip there and what type of impact do you think it'll have? Well, I think it'll have a very positive impact. The, the Indigenous people have been asking for some time for the Holy Father to come to Canada and uh, uh, apologize for the actions of the institutional church uh, in Canada for the residential school system. And this has been a desire on the part of many Native people, many Indigenous people in Canada for a very long time. And so uh, the reaction of this news has been uh, well received, uh, very positive. Um, as you know, the Holy Father has uh, made these kinds of uh, gestures before on behalf of the Catholic Church in different countries. He has a very uh, strong interest in peoples who have found themselves on the fringes of society, who have suffered because of systemic uh, racism, uh, colonialism, and those kind of things. And so uh, his presence will be most welcome when he does come.
Yeah, and, and going forward, um, how do you think the church will or should work towards healing and reconciliation with the indigenous people in the community? Well, uh, the, the church has, has been present in, in indigenous communities uh, since the beginning of the country and before, and that, and that presence continues. Uh, this will provide a big step forward in relationship it will be in building and rebuilding relationships and establishing new relationships. And so this will be a, a strong motivation to do even more uh, on the part of the church and will have a strong effect in Canada as well. And Your Excellency, before I let you go, just wondering if you have any final thoughts uh, about the Holy Father's visit to Canada in the future. Well, I think, uh, as I said before, we are all looking forward to this event. We've been working hard towards this for the past three years, actually. And uh, the delegation in Rome this coming December, uh, composed of elders, knowledge keepers, survivors of residential school and youth, will be a dialogical encounter with the Holy Father uh, and will be very positive in framing his visit, in helping to plan his visit uh, whenever that will be. And uh, so this is good news. It, it's hard news. It's, it's a, a challenge, hard for everyone, but good news. And uh, people are feeling very positive about it. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time today and speaking with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, analysis of the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border with tens of thousands of migrants on the move. Democrats in Illinois are considering a measure that would ban religious exemptions to the COVID-19 vaccine. For four decades, the state has protected those with faith-based concerns over certain medical treatments, but lawmakers who support the measure say COVID-19 is different because it is so highly contagious. Uh, judges ruled New York City's coronavirus vaccine mandate can take effect tomorrow. The measure is for police officers and other government workers. The police union has asked for a temporary restraining order. The judge also ruled city officials must appear in court next month to defend the requirement. A caravan of tens of thousands of migrants on foot are making their way through Mexico. The migrants hail from Haiti, South America and Central America. Last weekend, they clashed with police as they made their way from southern Mexico. They say they have been waiting in the city of Tapachula for refugee or asylum papers, but have grown tired of delays. And joining me now is Alfonso Aguilar, president of the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Alfonso, welcome back. Always great to see you. I, I want to talk more about this caravan of migrants. It seems to be very well organized, and we've heard reports that those in the caravan actually registered with QR codes. Uh, what more do you know about that? Well, it it's incredible. They are well organized. They have different uh, non-governmental organizations that put them together. Uh, they, they are using QR codes. Uh, these organizations uh, do have funders. So there are people that are funding them, uh, uh, funding, they're getting funding from, from the sources in the United States. Uh, and, and look, they, they know that the border is open. Uh, they know that many of these individuals will be able to enter the country illegally, or many will be able to just surrender to uh, to the Border Patrol, ask for asylum, knowing that they're eventually going to be released into the U.S. Um, so that's why this is happening. And this is one of many uh, caravans and mass movements of people we're going to see, uh, because the numbers continue to be very high. We saw the numbers for September. Uh, we received almost 200,000 people, uh, more or less the same number as in August. Uh, so these numbers are not going down. This continues. Uh, just in the, phys in, in the last fiscal year uh, that is just ending, um, we have received over 1.7 million people uh, at the U.S. border. That's the highest number in 35 years. That's incredible. But clearly, people understand that the border is open uh, and that's why they keep coming. Yeah, and Alfonso, do we know, uh, is the, the Department of Homeland Security doing anything at all to prepare? Well, I, I just don't think so. I mean, they haven't, they're not taking any measures. 
they're, again, good. I don't think we're ever going to be prepared to receive so many people at the southern border. So they know that they're going to detain a lot of people and they're going to have to continue to release them. So I think what they're doing is just setting up, setting up a system so that they can receive them and, and, uh, and, and release them into different parts of the country. So as you know, they're, they're transporting people from where they're detained. Many are detained in Texas and they fly them to different parts of the country. This is happening. There's just no coordination with, with uh, state governors, uh, but this is exactly what, we're, what they're doing. But, but there's no effort at all at dissuading these people from coming to our U.S. border. And this is exactly what they should be working on, finding ways, putting in place measures to ensure that uh, the people decide, decide not to make this very dangerous trek. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, Alfonso. I mean, what do you think what more should be done? And also, what has the response been in Mexico? Well, I, I think we heard recently from the Mexican foreign minister, uh, again, uh, uh, saying that uh, these people are not going to be able to enter the United States, that even they're not going to be able to go through Mexico, even though I must say that the majority are able to go through Mexican territory. But it is true that from time to time, Mexico, Mexican authorities intervene with this flows of people, with these caravans, and, and, and detain some people and return them to their home country. But the reality is that the only way we can stop this, the only way we can dissuade people from coming is to basically closing the border. And you achieve that by extending the wall system, by restating those common sense border security measures that President Trump put in place that ensured that we didn't have this inhumane, massive flows of people to our southern border. It means uh, reinstating fully the remaining Mexico policy so that people who ask for asylum have to remain in, in Mexico while their cases are being adjudicated. But none of that is actually being considered. This, if anything, we're finding ways to prevent the law from being enforced. Uh, just this week, Secretary Mayorkas issued a memo identifying different places in the country that uh, are deemed protected, where uh, immigration and customs enforcement officials cannot go in to enforce the law. Uh, this is trying to tie the hands of, uh, of ICE from doing their job. Uh, they're creating havens for undocumented immigrants where they can go and, 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 and be sure that they're not going to be detained and, and removed. Uh, so they're doing everything to accommodate uh, undocumented immigrants from ensuring that the law continues to be broken. They're not doing anything to enforce the law. And again, they're encouraging people to make this very dangerous trek. This is, after all, also a humanitarian crisis. People are putting themselves in harm risk to come to, to, come to the country, and it's because we're sending the message that they can get in. Yeah, we've heard so many of those stories, many of them heartbreaking. Alfonso, thank you so much for your time. So much more we could talk about. Alfonso Aguilar, president of the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Thank you again for your analysis. Up next, officials in Australia provide an update on the country's coronavirus lockdown and a report from Rome on an initiative that seeks to find ways for the church to help families. Australia is preparing to relax its travel restrictions for the first time in 19 months. Fully vaxxed Australians, um, we will see them being able to uh, travel overseas from next Monday. In New South Wales and v uh, Victoria and the ACT, they will be open. Prime Minister Scott Morrison made the announcement today prior to his own departure for Rome, where he will attend the G20 summit. India has test fired a nuclear capable intercontinental ballistic missile. New Delhi has a continued to upgrade its weapon systems over the past three decades to maintain what it calls minimum deterrence against its nuclear neighbors, China and Pakistan. Six people are dead and more than 20 are injured after Ethiopia's airstrikes today against Tigray. <laughs>
Tigray forces say civilian facilities have been hit, including factories and a clinic. Ethiopia's government contends that it is targeting military sites. The year-long civil war intensified last week after the government launched similar attacks. Portugal faces political and economic stalemate as it tries to emerge from COVID-19. Its parliament has narrowly rejected next year's budget. The minority socialist government did not receive support from radical members. New elections are likely in January. One of the pontifical universities in Rome is hosting an event tomorrow aimed at finding ways for the Catholic Church to help families. Communicating the beauty of the family, the proposals of the Italian Church is part of the 25th anniversary of the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Speakers at tomorrow's event include the head of the Italian Bishops' Conference and several priests and professors. Joining us now from Rome is Daniel Arasa, professor and communications dean at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. Professor Arasa, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit more about this meeting tomorrow and also why you're holding it now? Yes, thank you, Tracy, for this opportunity. Uh, we, are, we are celebrating in 2020 the 25th anniversary of the School of Church Communications, and we wanted to do so and finish really the celebrations of this year with this event, a uh, workshop dedicated to communicating the family. Uh, the reason is, is a double reason in the, in the first place, because our expertise in, is in communication, so, so we wanted to give our contribution to the family from our perspective as an academic institution. And the second reason is because we are celebrating this year with, uh, with Pope Francis, the year of the family, Amores Letizia. So we wanted to be present also from our perspectives in this event. And, Professor, can you tell us how this gathering, how it will emphasize the role of family in the Catholic Church? Yes, uh, certainly the family is, is under attack, uh, since uh, it's, not, it's not new that there are many difficult situations for the family, uh, difficulties, uh, poverty, immigration, the, um, the educational emergency. So we thought that it would be good to have a reflection, uh, a day of study with academics and people working in the field of church communications to see how the, the church and the, the institutions of the church can help in promoting the role of the family in society. The family is the vital cell of the society and we need to support it in all means as possible. Yeah, and you said, uh, you mentioned that the family is under attack uh, in the secular world. What ways can the Italian church defend and enhance the family? Well, there are many, really many initiatives. It would be impossible to to explain all of them. The same, in Italy, there are more than 200 dioceses, and each diocese has a family, a pastoral for the family, which many activities are promoted. I would say one of the, exam the great examples is Caritas. Caritas is doing a great job with families that are under the, the in situation of poverty, which is something that is growing even in, in countries like Italy, which uh, have a, a high degree of, of a, a very quality of life. No? And, but especially with the pandemic and, and other financial and economical crises, there are many families that are suffering, and, and the church is helping them uh, materially also. But I would like to remember that the, the, the main poverty is not the material one, it's the spiritual one. And, and I think the Catholic Church is doing a great educational activity in helping families and forming the new couples that are going to be married. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us. We appreciate it. Professor Daniel Rasa, Communications Dean at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Great speaking with you. Thank you so much. Well, the incoming bishop for the Diocese of Hong Kong has an interesting animal on his Episcopal coat of arms. Bishop Stephen Chow has a coat of arms that includes a giraffe. He says the world's tallest animal and its long neck symbolize the ability to see the big picture. He notes giraffes are also known for having big hearts, a sign of generosity. Bishop Chow will be consecrated as the new leader of the diocese in early December. In Britain, the late Sir David Amos' French Bulldog has won the Westminster Dog of the Year. Accepting the honors is Vivienne. Sentiment was in her favor because the popular late minister of Parliament was a self-proclaimed animal lover and advocate. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson tweeted his congratulations, saying that Amos, who was a Catholic, would 
have been proud. And congratulations to Vivian. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.